The Phantom Steamboat of the Tom Bigby by Catherine Tucker Wyndham. When the late winter rains send the Tom Bigby River out of its banks at Nanafalia, Tuscahoma, Nahaola, and Yellow Bluff, there sometimes rises out of the muddy water a ghost ship, the charred hull of a side wheel steamer. On those stormy nights, some folks along the river say they hear the gay music of a steam calliope and others report hearing agonizing cries for help blown on the cold river wind. It's the Eliza battle, whisper the folks who see the phantom boat and who hear the eerie sounds. It's the Eliza battle trying to finish her trip down to Mobile. Something terrible is going to happen. For always, the appearance of the phantom ship has heralded tragedy. Superstitious rivermen who see the ghostly hull rise from the water leave the river for safer jobs ashore. They know that the Eliza battle is warning them that the treacherous Tom Bigby will claim their lives, just as it claimed the lives of passengers and crew on the Eliza battle. The Eliza battle was one of the grandest steamers on the Tom Bigby. Built in New Albany, Indiana in 1852, she was a palatial boat and her trips up and down the Tom Bigby created excitement wherever she stopped. And no trip was so fine or so grand as her last, the one that began in late February, 1858. The Eliza Battle's trip down to Mobile had been advertised for weeks with circulars, handbills, and newspaper ads. In addition to the customary luxuries, the passengers were promised two bands to provide continuous music in the ballroom glowing lanterns to decorate the entire ship at night, colorful flags and bunting draped and festooned on every deck, a calliope to play the latest tunes and welcoming celebrations at landings all along the way. So an eager and carefree crowd of passengers was attracted aboard the Eliza Battle, bound for Mobile and the gaiety of that port city. At Columbus, they began to assemble. Ladies wearing full skirts, so fashionable then, and carrying tiny parasols, chatted excitedly as they boarded the boat. Behind them came their personal maids, and behind the maids came burly porters carrying trunks and valises and hat boxes. On the wharf, the men, plantation owners all, supervised the loading of their bales of cotton. Taking the cotton down to Mobile to sell provided their excuse for the trip. Carriages came from plantations throughout the area, and each group of new arrivals sparked fresh merriment as friends and relatives who had not seen each other in many months were reunited aboard the Eliza Battle. When the last bale of cotton had been loaded and the last valise had been put into the staterooms, some observers feared the cargo was just a little too heavy. The band struck up a lively tune. The deep voiced whistles sounded and the crowd cheered as the Eliza battle pulled away from the wharf and headed downstream. The scene was repeated on a smaller scale at landing after landing as up in the pilot house, Daniel Epps guided the Eliza battle down the river toward Mobile. Crowds of people bundled in wraps as protection against the increasing cold waited along the banks of the river to cheer and wave as the Eliza battle passed and their salutes were acknowledged by shrill trills from the calliope. After nightfall, some spectators set off rockets and other fireworks as the Eliza battle went steaming past. Epps, a veteran pilot, was uneasy. The high water had covered many of his navigation points, and the heavily loaded vessel was difficult to handle in the swift current. The strong and bitterly cold wind blowing rain in from the northwest added to his apprehension. Then, about nightfall, the rain turned to sleet mixed with snow as the temperature continued to drop rapidly. Captain S.G. Stone, master of the Eliza battle, joined Epps in the pilot house, and together they peered through the storm for familiar lights and landmarks. The sandbars and the shoals were covered by the swirling waters, and even the tall trees along the banks of the river were half submerged. The river seemed to stretch endlessly in all directions. Epps relied on his knowledge and experience to keep the Eliza battle in the main channel. He checked Mrs. Kemp's landing on his chart as the boat moved past that point, and he breathed a prayer of gratitude for safe passage that far. 
but he became increasingly anxious. The uneasiness of the pilot and the concern of the captain were not shared by the passengers. The brilliant lights in the ballroom pushed back all awareness of the menacing darkness outside, and the music of the bands drowned out the noise of the slashing storm. Long after midnight, the dancing continued as the partners whirled and glided on the polished floor. Then, above the music and the laughter came the cries of, Fire! Fire! The music, the laughter, and the dancing stopped. Men and women rushed for the exits. Even before they reached the deck, flames were leaping from blazing cotton bales and racing through the engine room, the cabins, and the gangways. Captain Stone ordered the pilot to run the boat into the riverbank, but the tiller rope had been burned and Epps could not carry out the order. The Eliza battle, ablaze from bow to stern, drifted crazily with the current. Passengers jumped into the icy water as they tried to escape the advancing flames. Some of them threw bales of cotton off the deck and attempted to use them for life rafts. Those who could swim fought the current to find temporary safety in the tops of the nearly submerged trees where they clung to the limbs and prayed to be rescued before they froze. For a little while, the flames from the burning boat lighted the scene, but soon the blazing hull drifted downstream and the darkness and the bitter cold closed in on the survivors. From the darkness came pitiful cries for help and prayers for deliverance. There were other sounds too, the heavy splashes of frozen bodies dropping into the river from the trees. But the tragedy produced its heroes. Among them was Frank Stone, second clerk of the boat, who swam ashore carrying to safety a child of Mr. and Mrs. Bat Cromwell of Mobile. He then placed a Miss Turner on a bale of cotton and guided her to the riverbank. His efforts to save her sister and her mother failed. The sister froze to death in his arms, and the mother died of cold while clinging to a tree. The glare from the burning boat and the screams of the victims aroused the inhabitants of Nahaola, a landing some 30 miles below Demopolis, and they hurried to the river to give what help they could. In the group was James Eskridge, who commandeered a skiff, the only one available, and paddled through the freezing storm to rescue survivors from treetops, from floating cotton bales, and from the edge of the water. For hour after endless hour, he maneuvered the small boat through the dark water, looking for survivors. Some witnesses credited him with bringing as many as 100 persons to safety. Meanwhile, as news of the tragedy spread, Planters from nearby plantations arrived with their skilled workmen who hastily built rafts and joined in the rescue operation. Later, these carpenters made rough coffins for the dead. People on the bank lighted huge bonfires to provide illumination for the rescuers and warmth for the nearly frozen survivors. As they were saved from the river, the passengers were taken to the large home of Mrs. Rebecca Coleman Pettigrew, where the house itself and all the outbuildings were converted into makeshift hospitals for the care of the injured and the ill. At one time, 75 persons were being cared for by Mrs. Pettigrew, her family, and her servants. All of her teams and wagons were assigned to hauling wood for the roaring fires, which kept the cold from claiming additional victims. Huge cauldrons of soup bubbled day and night to provide food for the survivors. For almost a week, Mrs. Pettigrew gave her full time to the care of her guests, doing everything possible for their comfort until their families could come for them. When the weather finally cleared and the river began to recede, the mournful task of recovering the bodies of the dead was completed. Nobody knows exactly how many lives were lost in the disaster. Some say 29, some say more than 50, but they all agree that the burning of the Eliza battle was probably the greatest tragedy in Alabama's river history. For years afterward, people who lived close to the river, who loved her and understood her moods, said the ghost of the Eliza battle still plied the Bigby's waters. On stormy nights, they said, they saw the great steamer rise up out of the troubled water. The boat, they said, was ablaze from bow to stern, so brightly lighted that the name Eliza Battle could be read plainly 
on even the darkest nights. And always there was music, dancing tunes, providing a background for the shrieks of terror and cries for help that came from the phantom vessel. Tales about the ghost vessel became a part of traditional Tom Bigby River lore. Most often, these apparitions were seen by crewmen of tugs and barges. And when these rivermen reached Mobile, they usually began looking for jobs ashore, safer employment away from the threatening river. Sometimes, speaking cautiously, they would describe the ghost ship to friends along the waterfront. And their listeners, rivermen like themselves, would nod with understanding. For they had seen the Eliza battle too. Ha, 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 ha.